Okay, so as I mentioned, this kind of like broadly fits under this idea of interactive storytelling. Um, storytelling is a very sort of broad term that can refer to lots of different things. So it's not really that useful in this case, but this is the term that you'll find. Right? Uh, and this is what people will be talking about in industry. When you're making something, especially in new media, you know, one side is the technology, but people always want to know what you're trying to get across, what you're trying to communicate. And if your project, no matter how nice the design is or how advanced or you know, unique the tech is, if it doesn't have a very cohesive theme or it isn't able to tell a story, it's not going to be as successful. Um, so there's a couple things that we want to think about when we're doing augmented reality or games or virtual reality. Uh, and that's the interactive component of the tech that we're using. Um, so last week, we kind of looked at a bunch of different examples from the history of augmented reality and some more recent examples. And there's probably certain things that you notice, certain themes that came out. Uh, and what I want to do today is just talk about a couple different themes and different ideas that, uh, you know, hopefully you should recognize from the examples that we've seen already. And in all of these cases, these we can consider these things both challenges and affordances. So those are two terms uh, that kind of balance each other. Challenges are things that you know make things difficult, um, that make it you know uh, hard to be clear about what you're doing. Affordances are things that make it easier. Affordances are things that are advantages that we get from uh, new media platforms. So a couple of things, a couple, one distinction I want to make when it comes to this type of stuff, uh, especially with uh, AR in particular, you tend to see storytelling fit broadly into do. One is more in commercial and uh, you know uh, information context with AR, we're just kind of adding a layer of information on top of uh, reality. So augmented reality. Uh, you know, we see this with like your weather app, with Google Maps, things like that. You have reality, and then we're mapping a layer of information on top of that. So that's one way that we see it, and that's where we see it in a lot of commercial context, how we see augmented reality added into uh, different environments. The other part, the other side of things with a lot of the artworks and games and more narrative projects is really adding a fictional layer on top of the world. And I think the thing there's I I couldn't come up with a better word for this. It's literally I just called it magic, like that feeling of having fiction, of having stories and and characters and you know uh, visuals imposed in reality. Uh, that is to me the more interesting side of this stuff. I think the information stuff is cool and useful, but to me I think what makes this technology exciting is the way that we can mix fictional worlds or fictional characters or fictional stories or whatever with the real world. There's a magic quality to this tech that we can't get with other types of technology. And so that's the thing I think we should focus on. Of course, you know, there's lots of different ways to approach it, but I think that's what's exciting about the technology and that's one of the affordances. So the challenge here, which is like, you know, related to this, is this feeling of what we always say is a tech demo. We don't want to create a tech demo. Tech demos are nice for, uh, you know, seeing how something works. That's kind of what I'm doing when I demo stuff in class. Uh, I'm showing this is how the technology works. But you don't want your finished product, whether it's a video game or augmented reality or virtual reality or whatever, you don't want it to feel like, this only exists because I think the tech is interesting. That's tricky because obviously the organizing principle of this class is looking at the technology behind these uh, you know, new platforms. Uh, but that's the biggest challenge is that we wanna make something that feels like it exists on the platform for a reason, not just because we think the platform is cool or you know, we chose the platform first and then created the content. Although of course that is what we're doing, uh, you know, I'm making you guys do an augmented reality project. And so it is very, you know, it's exactly what's happening, but we still want to think about a way to embed the technology into the experience of the project in a way that it's not noticeable, that it makes sense. Of course, we would be using 
the technology this so context is how we can get around that if we use storytelling use narrative framing to make the context clear we can make it so that people aren't paying attention to the tech or reacting to the tech they're reacting to the experience as a whole so it feels natural or embedded in the environment I think a really good example of this kind of thing is in-game or diegetic UI. You see this in a lot of examples. This is from Fallout, where you have your menus and your stats and all that are built into the game world. So it's still exact, it still behaves like a regular video game menu, but by having it diegetic or part of the game world, it adds this level of immersion. It makes it feel like this is part of, you know, this is part of reality. It doesn't take you outside of the fictional context of the game in order to see your stats or you know look at your map or what else it is it's built into the game world and so that little extra work of adding that context really uh you know adds a lot to the immersive quality of a game like fallout and there's a lot of examples of that. so another way to deal with that is a different type of context an existing fictional world that's a big part of why Pokemon Go works, because everybody knows the context of Pokemon Go. It's this extremely popular existing format. So you don't have to get people familiar with the idea, with the basic concept of Pokemon Go. They're already familiar with it. So that's another way of creating context is using an existing fictional. That doesn't have to be like proprietary content. Um, we'll see an example of this, but uh, or different examples of this, but. A lot of games use very common tropes like you know, zombies, things like that, that we're all familiar with. So we're already embedded in a context. And you know, the way that the technology is being used helps uh, is, is sort of part of that context. Um, so another example of an AR app, which is using data. So this is, I like this piece because it's very, very simple. And it is using data, but it kind of fits into both worlds because it's also creating a new fictional context. Um, this is from the New York Times. They have a lot of these examples. This is actually a good page to look at. If you wanna see a lot of examples of AR stuff. This is just a whole collection of all their AR stuff. But this is this really simple app that they made where it just visualizes uh, a world record, uh, or not a world record, but a, uh, a gold medalist uh, race, 100 meter race that you can run against and it shows you versus. So I think this does a good jo job of combining both of those things. There's sort of like a, a new fictional uh, uh, context created where you get to you know be in a race with a gold medalist, but it also is imposing real data onto a physical environment. Um, so this is kind of doing both. Uh, and yeah, there's a whole bunch of examples. I won't go through all of these, but you can see uh, actually says 31. So this is all these different AR projects that the New York Times has done. Most of these fall into the uh, data, you know, data imposition uh, uh, type. But some of them are, you know, this one is a game. There's a lot of different, a lot of different things in here. So this is a good place to look if you're looking for inspiration. There's kind of a lot of interesting different projects. So this is a really good example. This is a, you know, uh, it's not hugely popular. It's not Pokemon Go, but it's a relatively popular AR game called Ghost and Gun. And the thing, there's a couple of things that are interesting about this one. One is just, just literally the name Ghosts immediately creates the context that makes it. Ghosts are, is a thing that we're familiar with. And the one thing that we all know about Ghosts is that you can't see them, right? They're, they can be invisible. And so creating a game that, imposes ghosts into a real world is exactly, you know, it, that the fiction is basically just already done for you. We already have this context uh, that makes a lot of sense. In this game in particular, you kind of like place a portal into a, into a world and then it maps your space and then you just shoot ghosts. So it's very simple, um, but it does a lot of work of framing and creating the context just, just really simply with the title. It's also kind of interesting, this is a little bit tangential, but especially in comparison with Pokemon Go, there's this aspect of AR games 
of like thinking about the physical space that you're in. So we, that's another thing we have to do with, uh, with AR and VR as well when we get there is we do have to think about the physical space. Pokemon Go works in part because, you know, people, if a lot of people are all walking around the park with their phones looking for a Pokemon, it doesn't seem as crazy if you're sitting by yourself shooting ghosts and nobody else can see them. So this game may make more sense in the context of playing, you know, in your backyard or in your living room, whereas Pokemon Go works in public more easily because there's more people who are doing it at the same time. Um, so another AR, this is an older AR project, and I don't think, I, I've, you know, it's probably, it's probably fine. I'm just kind of using it as an example of something that's probably not the best uh, use of AR, where this was an old project where you had this book, and you could put the book in front of your PlayStation, PlayStation camera, could see what page you were on, and then it would create a video where you see animations on top of the book. But you're not looking at the book, you're looking at the TV. So it's kind of like, what's the point of even having the book in this case? Because we're not actually seeing it in its own context. I think this was very early. I think this game is from like, I don't know, 2000. I don't know exactly when this was. Uh, but I think it's an early version of the technology. So, you know, they were trying to explore it and find a way to use it. But it still kind of feels like this only exists because, you know, we thought of using the camera in the uh, another example of using location, this is a Wallace and Gromit project that I think is, is cool in some ways, but it also shows us the challenges in other ways. So it has a lot of different components. Some of it works inside, so you could actually do some of this here. But a lot of the components are tied to geolocation. So Pokemon also uses geolocation, but it's a little bit more widespread, whereas this one is tied to specific places, uh, some cities in England, and there's a city, uh, I think San Francisco in the US. And so it's, it's, you know, it's kind of using some of the cool aspects of the technology, but it's also limiting. If you can't just like go to one of these cities, you're not gonna be able to experience the full version of this app. So that's another challenge. It could be exciting. You can make a very local experience, but it's also gonna limit, you know, the people. So, uh, just to kind of wrap up, talking about uh, interactive storytelling. So there's a lot of different ways that we can think about interactive storytelling. Our what we're making in class is obviously a little bit limited. We don't have time to again, you know, uh, games. Uh, but they're still interactive in the sense that our user is in control of the experience. Excuse me, they're in control of the time and the space. Uh, and so. When we're creating, when we're thinking about framing, when we're creating interactive stories, especially in a spatial uh, way, like we are with AR, there's a couple of things that we need to keep in mind. There's a different way that information uh, works uh, in this context. So a couple examples of this, the Kuleshov effect, you guys are maybe familiar with this if you've taken like a video class at some point. Um, this is just like really, really basic like film, theory stuff that just says like things don't have to be uh, linear essentially we see the the idea behind the movie or this film or this experiment is that we see these different images and then we see the same image of the guy but we we project different emotion onto the guy after we see them. and the point it's making is that you know narrative isn't linear this one image can mean different things in different contexts. So the, the juxtaposition, and of course this is a linear film, and so it's just using the repetition to make the point. Uh, but the point is that the context is important. We need to create the narrative framing, and then our user is gonna project their ideas onto you know, the story. Another uh, way to think about interactive stories is to think about space. We're gonna be using space. Uh, it's kind of built into augmented reality. Uh, there's a lot of examples I could use for this, but I think this is a really good one. Oh no, it's a flash player. I thought I had, uh, oh, it's cause it's my other browser. Okay, let me get uh, the extension for this real quick.
Okay. There we go. Uh, so this is a pretty old interactive comic, and it's a collaborative comic, but I think it just does a really good job of explaining how interactive narrative is different than uh, linear narrative. So we have this comic. It starts out at this house. We click on this, and then it shows us we see the entire space of this comic. We see that there's all these different branches, all these different ways to read it. So there's one main narrative where we just go from uh, one comic to the next, but then there's all these branching narratives. There's all these sub narratives. There's all these like little ideas that play out. Some of them just end. We can go back up here. And so what I like about this is it shows how complex it is to manage an interactive story. We can think about the story as linear, but we can ha also have many different ways of going through it. There's, and we can't control the way that the user decides to the user is going to click on whatever it looks interesting to them. They may just read the main story and then, you know, not care about the context. They may spend their whole time looking at the context and not care about the main story. So what's great about this comic is that it really afford it has it affords the user to do to experience it in whatever they way they want to. It's not trying to force me to read it as a linear story. It's not trying to force me to read all of the content. It shows me how much stuff there is. It gives me sort of a map of the entire story. And then it leaves me to make decisions about what I want to experience and what I'm interested in. So again, there's a million different examples of this. I just think this is a really succinct way of showing how interactive stories are different than linear stories. That the user is in control, even if they're just in control of the space, even if they're just in control of time, we always have to consider the, that sort of uh, freedom of choice that the user is bringing. To um, and that has to inform the way that we communicate with them, you know, the context, what they're supposed to be doing, what they're supposed to be experiencing, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, hopefully that gives us a few things to consider as we, as we think more about the augmented reality project. Um, I'm going to stop the video here.